A very good morning. Welcome back. 6.22 now, Saturday, November the 23rd. I'm joined by Dr Raj Perso, consultant psychiatrist and all-round good egg. Uh, good morning. Morning. Good morning. Right, well, we're talking about all the top stories this morning. Let's take you through the front pages if you are just waking up. The Times front page, UK economy takes a hit after Labour tax increases. We were talking about Rachel Reeves and the budget. And she is still kind of standing there defending her budget, despite saying there would be no rise to tax, to national insurance, to VAT. Uh, and she was asked repeatedly about national insurance, and they said repeatedly they were not going to raise that, and, of course, then promptly raised employers' national insurance contributions. And this is the big story this morning. UK economy takes a hit after Labour tax increases. Britain's economy is stagnating, according to the latest figures. The tax rises in Rachel Reeves' budget are damaging business confidence. A private sector activity fell to a 13-month low in November as companies cut back on hiring and investment. Economists said that businesses had given a thumbs down to the budget. Well, they were very hemmed in, weren't they, by all these promises that what, what they weren't going to do. Mm. So the big puzzle was, what were they going but to they do? But they lied. Well, OK, but what a surprise. <laughs> well, <laughs> People lie to get into power. But what you're a surprise. saying that, what a surprise. But that's not acceptable, because if you are standing there and saying, this is what we are not going to do, and then you promptly do it... Mm then I don't think you should be able to do that. You, yes, but you live in a <laughs> lovely, cosy, warm, well. moral universe. <laughs> so, I do. time to come away from la-la land <laughs> right. and realise that people will do anything and say anything to get elected. Sorry to have to break the news to yeah, you. Yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. So, going back to reality, they were hemmed in by the fact they made all these promises. And the next question, of course, is to what extent is our politics in terms of who they target not determined by careful thinking about the economy. I mean, they picked on the farmers. Why do they pick on the farmers? Maybe because they thought they're, they're not going to be a popular group because they look like they're very well off, don't they? So mm. the, the electorate won't care so much if we hit the farmers hard. Mm. So to or the extent, elderly. How does that look? <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to them All in right, a second. Yeah. But the point is they're driven more by the optics than by actually thinking clearly about the economy. Possibly. So if we think about it that way, then we're all heading for disaster, I'm afraid to say, so, so, in terms of the economy. OK, let's just look at the psychological profile of someone who thinks we're going to hammer the farmers who <laughs> produce the food, that puts the food on the table, that gives us food security. That makes no sense. Yes, but you could, if you're going to mount that argument, I'm not defending I am, it. I I'm am not, mounting <laughs> that argument. You, you could say that about any tax that they hit with anyone, you could point, point, come up with an argument against it. They picked on people who they thought they could get away with it in terms of electoral popularity. That's how they decided who to target. Right. It had nothing to do with economics, I don't think. <laughs> right. This is a great line, though, in The Times. Responding to the figures, Rachel Reeves, the Chancellor, says, I'm not content with the state of the economy. I should think not. <laughs> <laughs> Daily Mail front page this morning. Private sector shrinks after Labour budget. Labour was last night accused of wrecking UK growth as businesses gave the thumbs down to Rachel Reeves' budget. Uh, the, this is Richard Fuller, the shadow chief secretary to the Treasury, said Labour's budget of broken promises has caused significant damage to the economy and working people. Of course, um, I don't, so for me, I don't think they thought this through. They, again... No, have, really? Well, yeah, yeah, they have compartmentalised... <laughs> that really came out of left field. Anyway, go on. Yeah. So they compartmentalised people who work mm. and then they sort of forgot about the employers. So if you hammer employers with tax guess what they do they don't employ people and they get rid of people I don't think it went through their minds well I also think they thought we've got four or five years in power it's a very big train set we'll <laughs> fiddle with it there'll be a couple of collisions over here but maybe we'll ride it out and it'll be okay in the end because we've got four or five years with a landslide majority we'll wait it out and see what happens so, so there are some brilliant memes that are going around I don't know whether I can show any of them but uh, about Rachel Rees because of course there, there's been all this stuff and Guido Fawkes has now un, un, unveiled even more stuff about Rachel Rees you mean her CV about her CV yeah. <laughs> and uh, whether she was really an economist or whether she <laughs> Really, really was sort of head of customer service. Hello, Halifax. Um, whether she really she answered the phone. Okay. Well, I think that's what she did. Right. And then suddenly she is the chancellor, and now she's not happy with the economy. No, because you've got no background at all. Um, and and it is it's extraordinary. And I wonder what you think psychologically. Keir Starmer flying back into the United Kingdom. You know, mm -hmm. he's meant to be in a honeymoon period. We're now at what 129 days, I mm -hmm. think, into a Labour administration. This is meant to be 
be the honeymoon. He must feel quite despondent. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently his popularity rating is so low, it's like almost like a record, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of how it is. far it's fallen off the side of a cliff. Mm. I think it's really interesting psychologically, because obviously he spent the last three or four years worrying a lot about being popular <laughs> and doing his best to try and be popular and mm. get elected. He didn't do very so, well. So I think it's going to hit him very hard indeed, because how to cope with unpopularity. A very important thing that all leaders need to be able to work out. And again, going back to Mrs Thatcher, she was very comfortable to some extent with not being popular because mm. she believed in something. Mm. Whether you were a fan of her or not, again, conviction politicians are people who are more likely to be able to withstand unpopularity. I Why think. do people go into politics? Ah, very good question. <laughs> um, if you uh, look at some of the scandals we've had over the years, you could say a very easy answer. Men go into politics to get laid, um, it would look it's like. A bit early. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> it would look like. There's two main reasons. Yeah, Either power. it's self-interested or mm. you want to make the world a better place. And, the, and I know you're looking at me a funny look. But well, well, only because I'm in politics. That's why, that's why I'm looking at you like that. <laughs> yeah, but is, is it self-interest? Is mm. it to line their own nest? And all, all our ex-prime ministers have ended up being multimillionaires as a result of money they've made after. The, the question mm. is, why did they become prime minister? Was it Were they thinking afterwards about the feathering of their nest that would occur? Or, to what extent, we need you, people who well, want to leave the world a better place? Could you really motivate yourself with that end goal of making millions of pounds all the way through standing for a as a constituency MP, working your way up into the parliamentary party and then becoming a junior minister. Would you really be able to do all of that if your overriding drive is to make money later on? Well, it's a very, Maybe. very difficult job. I mean, you're not paid a huge amount of money no. as an MP, and it's a tough job in terms of constituency surgeries and so on. So the question is, why do people do that? Um, and are, we need a group of people who are, who are not um, self-interested, mm. basically, and who want to leave the world a better place. Mm. And to what extent does our system create or generate those people? It's, a, it's so interesting, actually. Uh, business, this is the front page of the FT. Business blames the budget for gloom. The pound fell 0.5% against the dollar. Oh, good, to uh, $1.252. It's weakest since May. Disappointing retail sales. And this reiterates the point that companies were giving a thumbs down to the policies announced in the budget. Also, and this is all tied to it, the front page of the Daily Express, um, disastrous raid on social care. Again, not thought through. Is it? Because, of course, social care relies on private providers. Those pe private providers pay people. Not enough, in my humble opinion. But they pay people. And then, of course, you're going to have to increase your national insurance contributions. And that will be disastrous for a care sector already on its knees. Well, I think what happened was that they hit certain people, as we discussed before, and they thought somehow those other people will solve the problems that we've created. I think that's one of the things they thought through. Yeah. Or didn't think through. Well, that's the point. They didn't think it through. And there's another great story about um, Keir Starmer and when he, he basically said, well, the BBC verifiers actually looked at our numbers. Well, they relied on two men and a calculator, didn't they? I mean, it wasn't actually but another, thought through. Another interesting question, because Labour were in opposition for so long. If you're in opposition for a very long period of time, do you forget how to govern? Yes. Because actually people around you are no longer people who used to be in the Cabinet, for example. Well, and a very good point to that is Yvette Cooper saying, I couldn't possibly comment on whether Netanyahu would be arrested. Well, you're Home Secretary, so you'd all <laughs> to have an opinion at exactly. this point yeah yeah i think i think it's a very valid point indeed raj thank you for the moment we'll take a break we'll continue with the front pages after this break this is weekend breakfast good morning welcome back 6 33 i'm asking this morning what impact have labor policies had on you this could be about your kind of aspirations your work or your mental health for example uh, sharon miller lovely to hear from you this morning good morning dr paul always a pleasure to see you at the weekend and to see you in such a lovely shirt you're wearing dr raj i'm just holding that over you. Um, Labour policies haven't done a thing for me. Something, someone that has worked all my working life, nothing they do is for taxpayers that work and contribute to society. All they can care about is people that do not work and, uh, and contribute and asylum seekers. I'm sick of them. And well done to the people that voted for the useless Labour government. I do hope that you're all proud of yourselves. Claire says, good morning, David. Good morning to you. Uh, Labour has left me more cynical and despondent about the travel of politics in this country. I didn't vote for Labour or the damage they're doing to my country in capital letters. The duty of a government is to put their people first and foremost instead of lying and screwing them. I voted reform and our voting system must change, otherwise we will never have change for the better. It's, it is interesting how quickly the, the, the ruling party has fallen out of favour. 
And also, the theme of a lot of those messages is of a sense of unfairness. I think that's a very important point, that people want to yeah. feel, even if they've elected or not voted for the government that's in power, they want to feel at least that we live in a society where fairness is occurring. And there's a lot of simmering resentment, isn't there? There that, is. That uh, there's a lot of inequality or injustice, or people feel the victims of an unfair policy or unfair government. And some people are being favoured, and the vast majority feel it's not them. Yeah. Let's move on and uh, we're taking you through the front pages this morning if you are just waking up. This is the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Trump threatens sanctions on the ICC. We spoke about this right at the beginning of the programme. Donald Trump is considering sanctions against this British lawyer over the ICC's arrest warrant for Benjamin Netanyahu. So the ICC has issued a warrant for the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, also Yov Galant, the former Israeli Defence Minister. And this is a chap called Kareem Khan KC. He is the chief prime prosecutor and he could be amongst the officials targeted for sanctions by the president-elect. Now this is fascinating because of course the US is not a signatory to the ICC, neither is Russia, but as I said earlier you've got Joseph Burrell speaking on behalf of the EU uh, countries saying that it has to be legally binding. Keir Starmer, very interesting position here because the US, our closest ally, and at the same time he's issued some sort of wet, it really is a wet statement about I believe in international law well, does that mean you're going to abide by the ICC ruling or not? Yeah, and also one of the big questions is where, where does the funding for the ICC come from? Because that's where the, real, the power always is, follow the money. Yeah. And because I think the US is not a signatory, they don't fund it, therefore their ability to have influence on it is very limited. So I think that because the funding comes from other countries, who so all seem to be upholding the decision, the ICC at the moment won't be that worried about what the US is up to. But the United Nations is largely funded by the US, so it has a lot more power and influence there as a result, I think. So it's always follow the money. Who pays for it? <laughs> it's a question. It's a great maxim. <laughs> uh, the Guardian front page this morning, this is, this is another story that I'm really interested in. Gordon Brown has weighed into the assisted dying debate. He says it's not the answer. And I totally understand where he's coming from. This is uh, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, has said he is opposed to the legalisation of assisted dying because of his newborn daughter's death. But there, if for my money, there is a very big difference between a premature child or a newborn child and someone reaching the end of their life, you and I have both treated people like this, who are in terrible pain, who are doubly incontinent, who are pleading with you to help them out of their misery. And I fundamentally object to these politicians wading in publicly to tell me what their belief structures are before the vote. Well, uh, and also they're usually based on some personal experience, which is very emotive, right? Yeah. But the, the reality is that they haven't dealt, as you and I have done, with people in that very uncomfortable situation where life really literally isn't worth living for, mm. for many of those people. And we're not hearing enough from doctors speaking out, I think, or contributing to the debate, because they're the ones actually... But don't you think they're the frightened? It. I think they are very frightened, yeah. They're also worried about being sued afterwards if they say that, you know, I did deal with this very, very ill person mm. and... You know, they, they may cover up the story, but, but the, the words would indicate they help them along their way, mm. as it were, because we both know a lot of that is actually going on. We do. But, we, but it's on the, on the edge of the tightrope of, is it legal? And I think doctors are scared of that. And, and I was trying to explain to people about how you titrate analgesia against the pain and the side effects of that titration. Yes, and I think doctors actually have been very skilled and the conversations they've had with relatives, you know, like we're going to up the dose because of the pain, there's been usually a veiled statement going on with the relatives to understand full well that also what is happening mm. is someone is being eased out of a very, very great deal of suffering in terms of still being alive. So I think that doctors and relatives often understand what's going on in that conversation. Mm. How would you vote? Um, well, I'm... Uh, would would agree that um, we, a lot of doctors are put in a very uncomfortable situation where they're worried about being sued and a lot of relatives and we've had high profile cases of people apparently have broken the law to try and save a loved one from carrying on living so I'm, a fa I'm in favour of a change in the law that allows a clear cut case of someone who is suffering enormously because I don't believe life is worth living under any circumstances. I would agree. I'm totally so, with so you. I'm a, I'm a, I'm but do you think that's also that because that. we have treated people in that, in those terrible circumstances? Yeah, I think so. But somehow we need to get that experience out there because unless you've really been there, you won't realise what it's like. No, you won't. you won't. But people are very scared because they don't trust our institutions. They're scared it's going to get abused. That's one of the problems, aren't they? They're scared that people um, will get polished off yes. simply because people are after the inheritance or something like that. So, so it's a lack of trust in our institutions that underlies one of the reasons why people are not in favour of a change in the legislation.
They That's really doctors. interesting. That's really interesting. Also, I think it's about fear. I've just written an article for the Daily Mail, but when I was training, there was this brilliant, brilliant uh, consultant who said to me, we, we want people to come into this world with a great birth experience, and I want people to have a great death experience. And that stayed with me ever since. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But So we need the law to support doctors. That's, but I go back yeah. to my point that because people don't trust doctors these days or trust politicians, they're worried about a change of the law, will open the door, and people will be being polished off for other reasons, who are not really suffering, mm. and something else is going on. Let's talk about the front page of the eye this morning. Weight loss, hosp jab, hospital cases surge. This is about Wagovi, uh, the GLP-2 agonist. The fact is the number of people admitted to hospital after suffering bad reactions linked to the weight loss jab injections is four times higher than previously reported. Um, 274 people have been admitted to hospital, far higher than the 68 announced by UK health watchdogs last month. Well, these drugs are very interesting because the share prices of all the companies involved in this area have skyrocketed. Yeah. So everyone is believing this is the next big thing. But you and I as doctors also <laughs> understand this idea that comes along every few years of a magic bullet doesn't exist. All drugs have side effects. Of course they do. And, and it's much better to try and become thinner by exercising and watching your diet. A change of lifestyle which is different difficult and hard work and people want to avoid the hard work by the magic bullet and lo and behold what's happening is side effects are being uncovered yeah and it's and about retraining your body and your mind that's the crucial part of this isn't it but also uh, because a lot of people say they don't have side effects but all drugs do have side effects what's interesting a lot of articles are saying because thin being thin is something we look up to and uh, mm. envy yourself if everyone's thin it will stop being the sort of status symbol yes because in, in the future that, but, but that historical precedent was to be fat was to be wealthy yeah. wasn't it yeah and in poorer countries where people are starving to be being overweight mm. is a sign of status but now in our society <laughs> it's, it's quite a, the contrary yeah because it's a signal that you you've got the time to go to the gym and you're going to afford to go to the gym etc etc there's that quite a distinct lot of evidence about a class structure around that that the worse off you are socioeconomically in a country like britain the more likely you are to be overweight so it is a signal, being thin is a signal of class as well and status, I think. That's absolutely but, but will that change when you can get an injection and you don't have to go to the gym in order N to appear yes. svelte like you? <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. Uh, front page of The Sun this morning, Kate's gift of love. The Princess of Wales has invited child survivors of the Southport stabbing horror and the victim's families to her Christmas carol concert. Caring Kate, as they call her, 42 met them in private last month. They will be reunited at Westminster Abbey on December the 6th. Uh, the front page of the mirror the king uh, is obviously making good recovery here he's planning a major tour of the indian subcontinent according to them it's a trip to bangladesh india and pakistan which was act after the queen's death in 2022 and it shows his cancer recovery is going well and the, finally the front page of the daily star <laughs> big headline 72 million pounds for a man in a hat to sit on a chair. That is the front page of the King and the, the coronation, actually. Uh, then the byline is 72 million waste of Chaz's coronation sparks protest. I'm not sure that's true, whether it sparks protest. Actually, it was a rather brilliant occasion. They go further to say, actually, that 72 million quid would fund 2,057 nurses. My understanding is that it actually cost half the amount that the, the late Queen's funeral cost. Okay, but he's he's going on a tour of India, did you say? Yes. Okay. Well, that's I mean, India's a wonderful country. It is. I don't like going to India because everyone there looks like me. Yeah. Therefore, I, I just <laughs> fade into you the background. You don't like it. I don't like that. <laughs> look, look at me. I want look to at stand me. out. Yes, very much so. No, I, I I've spent a lot of time in India, and also it's just amazing. Um, I I'm very lucky. I met Modi when I was last there. Okay. I know. Look at me. Um, <laughs> but it's an extraordinary country, and to watch it mm. and the way it's developed so mm. quickly, yeah. and you've got this burgeoning middle class, haven't you? Particularly those people, doctors and lawyers and all the rest of it. And you're seeing all the generic medicines being made in India. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And also they've got this incredible Bollywood film industry where yes. they churn out a film you in a day. In one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sing or dance. Ah, doesn't stop most people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rod, thanks very much. Let's uh, let's take a break. We'll continue this after the break. Good morning. Welcome back. Uh, this is Talk. I'm asking this morning, what impact has Labour had on you, the policies particularly? What uh, impact have the policies had on you? They can be anything about your state of mind. It might be your aspiration. It might be your job, your family, your concern about what's going on. The number Oh three double four four nine nine one thousand. Those calls are charged at the national rate. You can text the word "talk" in your message to eight seven treble two. Um, and you can also uh, follow us and message us on X as well. The address is at Talk TV. Chris has sent us a voice note. Thanks very much, Chris. Good morning. 
Chris from Dorset. Good morning, David. Great show as usual. What's made me angry is about the Labour government, just about everything. I'm angry about their lies. I'm particularly angry about the fact that 20% of the electorate, I know it's 34% of those who voted, but 20% of us voted for this, and yet they claim to have a massive mandate. Now, in one sense, in the parliamentary sense, they do, but they don't have the people behind them what they're doing, and yet they plough on. When you have that sort of weak mandate, and it is a weak mandate, you should be a lot more careful about the policies that you introduce. What they've done to the farmers, I mean, to give 500 billion away to foreign farmers for their climate change whilst at the same time taking 500 million from our farmers is nonsense. To take away the winter fuel allowance. Did you hear that woman, Teresa, on the show the other afternoon on talk? I mean, it just everything makes me angry about Labour. Unfairness. Well, what people don't realise is that they're taking the hit now in terms of the tax, but Labour is traditionally on the left of politics a spending party, so they're yes. going to spend more on the health service. What they're calculating is you'll discover you'll be able to get, theoretically, an appointment at your GP uh, in several months' time. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you I, quizzically. I, I, I know, but I'm just saying, this is the thinking. We're going to spend a lot of money, we're right. taking money, we're going to spend a lot, and people will discover an improvement in services. But they won't. I, I, Sorry. Just, I mean, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> let me explain the thinking. <laughs> okay. Can okay, come in with the floor. Of the yeah. Thing. Okay. Okay. And therefore, then people will be less angry because they'll realise they can get an appointment at their GP. I agree with you. What will happen is a lot of the money will be wasted, and there'll be a lot of inefficiency that won't be fixed. And what Labour often doesn't realise is you've got to efficiently spend the money, ju not just spend the money, not just chuck the money <laughs> at something. Yeah. Um, you know, as they say, you know, if you throw money at a problem, it becomes an expensive problem. Yeah. It just in terms of that, and the, and the fight with the farmers, of course, the 500 million that they get back will pay for 1.5, what is it, minutes or something of the health service. I mean, so the, the maths don't add up at all. Let's go uh, to your papers this morning. This is the Daily Mail, page 9. Um, we were just looking at this. Tell us this story. So this is about Liam Payne. There's been a new revelation, and that the headline here is Last Pictures that raised disturbing questions about whether Liam Payne could have been saved. Um, of course they're upsetting, but vitally they prove the star was carried from the hotel lobby back to his room by three staff members just oh. 10 minutes before he died. So why did they move him there if he was in such a state? It is a shocking picture because they show f uh, several people carrying someone who is unconscious. The face is is, is, is fuzzed out so you can't see who it is, but someone who is utterly unconscious back to their hotel room. Someone in that state who is unconscious in a hotel lobby, you should leave them and call an ambulance. Of course you and should. And they didn't do that. And one of the questions, of course, is for several reasons did they not do that because they were complicit in the supplying of drugs which is one of the scandals that has theoretically come out about the story or were they in awe of the fact they were dealing with a celebrity so they didn't treat the celebrity they would treat an ordinary human being and call an ambulance were they or was it to bit. protect the reputation of the hotel? Yes, all of these things could have been going on. But the, but the picture is a shocking discovery because it suggests that actually he could have been saved. It was before the idea we got was that this was a situation that was so out of control. Although there was a kind of strange thing about the reception calling, I think, the police or the ambulance and saying someone's out of control in their hotel room. When you'd have thought if someone's out of control in the hotel room, go in there and do something about it. Yes, you would. Hmm. And of course we were saying he uh, was on a cocktail of drugs as well. We talked about this uh, just now in the break, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, they said it was pink cocaine. Pink cocaine is a is a mixture of things, including ketamines. It's a very dangerous combination of drugs. Very dangerous. Um, and so one of the other things that's come out about him falling off this third floor balcony was, was he attempting to, because apparently, according to the newspaper article, he was famous for um, bodyguards and so on, trying to stop him getting access to drugs. So he would find other routes out of hotels to try to get hold of drugs or to, to break the cordon that was around him. And so did he fall out of this window because it was another attempt as it were maybe to get out of the hotel room wow. and get access because we believed until this point it was the side effects of the drug that yes was, uh, that obviously right. he was he was high and therefore jumped off that balcony but obviously that sheds new light let's move to uh, your next story which is the daily express page six this is a thrilling headline moscow's nuclear weapon could hit the uk in 20 minutes 
Yes, so uh, the, the uh, headline um, is Moscow's nuclear weapon could hit UK in 20 minutes. And the sub-headline, uh, uh, sorry, because Ukraine warned the West yesterday that the ballistic missile Russia used to strike the country could hit the UK in just 20 minutes. So is there a psychological war going on here whereby Ukraine is really worried that the West is going to turn its back on them because of Trump being elected? Yeah. So they're trying to use the psychology of fear. They're going to make the West frightened that if it's Ukraine now, it'll be you next to try and get... Mm. Western countries. I have to say there's something about this headline that to me is redolent or makes you remember another very famous headline from many years ago about Iraqi weapons could hit the UK Indeed. in 15 minutes. And the other thing I was hearing from a US senator talking about well, the reason we need to supply arms to the Ukraine is when Ukraine folds, it will be Poland next. And then it's kind of domino effect. Well, that's what the Vietnam War was all about. They yes. fought that war, which now was deeply regrettable because of this domino effect idea that Vietnam now, then a few countries later down, they're knocking on your door because they're in Mexico. And that, that yeah. is a famous argument, this domino effect argument, which has led to a lot of needless deaths, in my opinion. So, so you think this is psychological warfare on the part of Ukraine yes, to pressurise us? I do us. think so. I do think so. Because I think it's very, very unlikely, even if Moscow's nuclear weapons could hit the UK in 20 minutes, that we should worry about that. Because well, I, don't think, I don't think it's likely that, that Putin's going to press that button, because that would mean, but Putin obviously, is annihilation. But Putin is also waging psychological warfare, because, of course, his defence secretary has now said the UK is now fundamentally involved, because Ukraine <laughs> is using UK-made weapons to strike into the heart of Russia. Yes, so there is psychological warfare going on. The, the, the Russia's threatening the UK, definitely, just because a threat doesn't mean in this poker mm. game people really are holding cards and, and they're willing to play. And the, and the stakes are very high indeed, aren't mm. they? Let's just talk now about uh, your article in the Times, page two. Yes, so uh, the headline is long-term sickness rise puts Britain out of work. And you and I as doctors, doctors mm. are really at the centre of this because doctors are signing off people into long-term sick all the time. And doctors, I think, find it very difficult to say no to patients and ask for a sick note. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how, yeah. how, how well, many doctors also, you know Well, it's also the no. easy option, isn't it? Because yeah. actually you're under time pressure and so it's easier to say yes, we'll sign you off than yeah. it is to go through... Um, the list of things that you need to then, uh, you know, ask them about, but also the pressure from the patient on you. I think that undermines the doctor-patient relationship. Yeah, definitely. But the the problem, the, the sort of elephant in the room, is that doctors are at the heart of this because doctors are busy signing these forms yeah. off, letting people take time off work through sickness, and they're unable to say to patients, I'm not sure that you're that sick, <laughs> and I actually think working may be yeah. better for you than taking time off. So doctors are unable to say no to patients. They're scared of doing that. Well, they Because they're, they're worried about a complaint, for example, from the patient. <sighs> just, so just, the, the power balance has shifted in, a, in an unhealthy direction, I think. And we're going to be talking about that, the disability benefits with Rakib Hassan, a social policy analyst at about 9 o'clock uh, this morning, so a couple of hours uh, time. Really fascinating. Um, just this final story, if we can. The Sun, page 18. Um, I can't oh. read your writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Frank yeah, Skinner. Yes, there we go. I really want Frank to get Skinner. I really yes. want to get married at 67. Yeah, so his long-term girlfriend has rejected him. He's made mar four marriage proposals, and she said no, no. four times. So we, they're living together, so they're more or less like husband and wife, but he really wants to get married. Um, at How old is he? He's 67. Yeah. He says having a girlfriend is like saying, I have a skateboard. Uh, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> at his age, he thinks he ought to be married. But the question is, why is his partner re yes. rebuffing him? What's all the, the psychology? Time? Well, he says it's because she's worried because her parents got divorced. So she got a bit cynical about it and thinks if we get married, it would be like a slight curse on the thing. So is it? A lot of people do think that, but because their parents got divorced, despite the fact they've been living together for decades, right. once we get married, <laughs> that's it. It's curtains. <laughs> right. So, wow. but I, I but I wonder why psychologically does he push Persist in constantly yes. proposing. Um, but also then you get negative reinforcement because every time he asks, she says no. I know, so I would give up. At some I point. would give up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he needs to find someone else. <laughs> easy. Oh, wow. Well, well, okay, easy. Uh, Ross, thanks for the moment.